I didn't want to start that one. Okay. So we have already 45, 44, 46 participants. So Drew, do you want me to get started, ma'am? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, let's get started. I don't believe in Chicano time. I believe when something says six o'clock, it's six o'clock and it's 6.03 right now. So let's get started. Welcome, Hinted, to our second uh, Zoom uh, program sponsored by the Riverside Art Museum. Today we're going to have a discussion with uh, Luis uh, uh, Garza and Oscar Castillo. I'm going to ask all you folks to please uh, turn off your uh, video uh, so that uh, the only thing that pops up on screen are the three uh, panelists. Uh, the title of today's program is documenting uh, the movement or documenting social discord, documenting uh, history. If you know anything about the Chicano movement of the 60s, uh, it was a turbulent time. Uh, it, it, at some point, it got even violent, not because Chicanos wanted it to be violent, but because the uh, reaction uh, was violent. The Chicano movement has been described as being a renaissance, a looking back, a looking into uh, our history, our culture, a rediscovery of music, a rediscovery of art, a rediscovery of historical uh, figures. It was a, an examination of our status in society. We kind of looked around and despite serving with distinction in World War II, despite the creation of LULAC and MAPA and the GI Forum, we saw that our position in society was still very tenuous. We weren't allowed to live where we wanted to live because of redlining, because of a covenant uh, uh, that restricted certain types of people from buying certain property. We saw that the job market, that there was not, not just a ceiling, but a concrete wall that just did not let us go beyond a, a certain point. Chicanos were not getting educated. Uh, the superintendent of schools in LA County, uh, uh, in, in one of the famous quotes said, 
that educating uh, Chicanos was worthless, was useless, was a waste of time, energy, and resource because we were best suited for stoop labor, meaning the only thing we were good for was uh, working in the uh, fields. So those were the kinds of things, uh, the position that we found ourselves in. And when the movement started, it was a call, a call to action. And it, you know, it told artists, go out and paint, go out and draw, you know, paint history, play, paint slices of life. Poets are supposed to talk about struggle. Photographers are supposed to document. Everybody had a role from the professor to the student, to the comadre, everyone. It was a call for everyone to get involved. And tonight we have two fantastic uh, 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 folks who have agreed to talk to us about their efforts and what they were doing back early in the uh, 60s. So I have uh, Luis Agarza and I have Oscar Castillo. It is my belief that, you know, we don't, um, that who we are today is based upon what we were when we were kids what kind of family we grew up in, what kind of experiences we have. So before we get started, I, I want to know a little bit about you folks because may, people may know your name, but people may not know anything at all. Or people may know your image, but they may not know the name that's associated with the image. So I want you just for a little, as, as much as you feel comfortable, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. So Luis, I'm gonna start with you. Where did you grow up? Uh, what kind of home life did you have? Uh, were you in a you know complete family unit, mom and dad, extended families? What was the social economic condition of your family as compared to the social economic conditions of your area and of the times? Hmm. Okay. Pues, <laughs> I was born in a war zone. 537 East 139th Street between Sands and Brook Avenue in the South Bronx. My family is from Nava, Coahuila, Mexico, and the uh, South Texas border areas. And in the mid 1920s, early 20s, uh, part of the family migrated to New York City. Um, both my mother's side, Valdez, and my father's side, Garza, the brothers and sisters intermarried and a little colonia was established in New York in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. It was the opening of The Godfather Part Two when they arrived. And uh, they were looking for un compañero who had sent, him, sent them a letter saying that there was work. So they took a coastal ferry out of Galveston, Texas, and along the Gulf of Mexico, around Florida, and up to New York City, they landed in 1922, thereabouts is uh, what I estimate. And they found their way into 112th Street and Lexington Avenue in Little Italy. And uh, they approached the superintendent of the building and he told them, well, he's moved, he's gone. We don't know where. He says, but the apartment is available. And uh, if you want uh, to rent it, we'll take it, they said. And it was a fifth floor. Mm -hmm cold water flat walk up that they took. And that began my family from Northern Mexico, South Texas into the New York area. And uh, I was born in the South Bronx in 1943. I'm 77 years old or 77 years young. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a little bit of a brief with my family in terms of their journey. The family was Mexicano to the core. Papa didn't speak much English apart from being able to tell you where to go if he didn't like you and uh, mama was bilingual, and the family was Mexicano to the core. But outside, it was everything else. It was Boricua, it was Italian, Irish, German, Jewish. I became all of them by osmosis in order to survive. We were the only Mexicanos in the area. But I never lost my sense of who I was as a Mexicano. And it certainly became more refined and defined when I arrived here in Los Angeles in the mid-1960s. And so, so I, being, oh, go ahead. Being from the East Coast, I now know where, where, where you get the accent from. Uh, yeah, it, it pops up more often when I'm with other New Yorkers and the toity toity and toity street comes out in me, you know? <laughs> uh, so yeah, the New York attitude definitely sticks with me. It's never left me, which has been part of my uh, ability to survive. 
being a loner in New York as a Mexicano, uh, talk about being a minority. <laughs> we did not have a network. We did not have anything to fall back on as uh, most of the other immigrant groups in New York had. So it was quite distinct growing up Mexicano. It was surreal. It was a, a Fellini, if you will. And, um, but it was one that I was quite proud of because it set me apart from everybody else. And as we moved from neighborhood to neighborhood, uh, learning to survive amongst Italians, Irish, Jews, Poles, and Blacks, and Boricuas, and everybody else, uh, you know, you learn how to navigate. And that's what I've done all the way up to the present. Oscar, yes. uh, how, how much uh, do you feel comfortable chatting about um, your well, background? Sure, I, I'm, I'm, um, I've, um, I've rehearsed my, I, I've gone over my background, I've been thinking about it and all that. And uh, although yesterday I expressed a you know, desire to kind of keep that in the background, but I'll, I'll give you my, my spiel. I'm originally from El Paso, Texas. That's where I was born. My grandparents came from Zacatecas on my mother's side and on my, no, I'm sorry, on my father's side. On my mother's side, uh, as far as I can figure, they're all from the Texas, New Mexico area. And I even suspect my great grandmother was full blooded uh, Isleta Indian. Um, she, her last name was Pompa or Pompas. And apparently she was, a, she was an orphan and she was raised by the nuns at the Isleta mission. So, uh, and, and all of these, uh, the, the, all of these things, they believe it or not contributed to my interest in photography because as a youth, I was growing up in El Paso. We were a very close family. We, we always lived in the close proximity to our grandparents and our aunts. We practically, just about everybody lived on the same block practically or within walking distance. And in some cases in the same home, same house. So we were very extended family. And uh, my grandparents, all of them, all, always spoke Spanish. I never heard them speak utter a word in English, although they could if they were pressed, but uh, my father was a professional. He, uh, he, uh, he actually was a career officer in the Air Force, and he always inst instilled in us uh, to learn English and speak English. And my mother, up until we were teenagers, she always talked to us in Spanish. So we are always a bilingual family, and, and to this day, I, I love speaking Spanish, talking to people that speak Spanish. And I, I you know, I use that. Um, that inspires me, the music, the culture, the, the familia. And um, that, that has helped me to develop a sense of community in my photography. And anyway, I, I, um, that in a nutshell, I mean, I, I, we did live in other places. I was, uh, uh, fortunate to live in, in Massachusetts, in uh, Bermuda, in Washington State, and uh, eventually in California because my father was in the Air Force, so we, we traveled a little bit. And so I was always a, exposed to two cultures, but we moved to California when I was, um, uh, my parents got divorced, so obviously we traveled different ways, but uh, moved to California in the um, like the early 60s and I was in high school at the time I, I went to Belmont High School um, where I you know played uh, football you know did the track stuff and all that and then eventually was went to college for a year but was drafted in the Vietnam War but I joined the uh, the Marine Corps instead of being drafted I said well I don't want to go in the army I'm going to join the Marine Corps so I went into the Marine Corps and uh, when I was in Japan, that's where I really got turned on to photography. Um, I bought a camera, I taught, self taught myself. And uh, even though before, when I was in high school, my mother had given me a little brownie, which I started not snapping pictures with. So, and I, I'll go back to my, my, my previous statement that my mother created an album, which I still have, and that created, it had images of all my family, my grandparents, people I never met. And I, I knew the story of the family from that album, which I still own. But anyway, um, uh, in here you ask, well, how did I get involved with, with La Raza newspaper? I think, is that here or in another Yeah, let's, in let, another let's, let's pause there. Let's, uh, let, uh, Luis, okay. 
Luis, when did you come to California and how did you get involved in photography? Because you're in the East Coast. How did you wind up in Califas? Go west, young man, go west. <laughs> um, after uh, I got out of the uh, service, I was in the United States Navy. And uh, as a kiddie cruiser, I joined when I was 17 and a half years old. And I served out of Norfolk, Virginia on a naval destroyer. And um, that was 1960 to 63. And I saw, I saw uh, the Navy and the discrimination in the South because we were based out of Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, we were part of the blockade and ships that uh, uh, escorted the Cuban rebels from Nicaragua and some uh, old, sh old cargo ships into the Bay of Pigs. Uh, so there's a, a whole other history there, uh, which is part of the political evolution of my, uh, my thinking. Uh, but uh, I wish I had picked up the camera then. I didn't pick up the camera until I came out to California in 1965. I got out here uh, about a week or so before the uh, Watts uh, Rebellion. And uh, it was a family of Puerto Rican uh, Mexicanos who were living in Pico Rivera, who uh, had come out from New York City. And uh, so they put me up for a little while and, uh, and then I split. And, started making my way around. I didn't know anybody, didn't have any friends or anybody. So I was just cruising. Uh, went to this college, went to LACC and uh, picked up a little brownie camera. I started taking photographs in 1966. I was going back and forth between LA and New York. Uh, you would transport taxi cabs, reconditioned taxi cabs, and you'd drive them four or five days. A bunch of us would uh, jump in the car and Pop Benny, smoke a couple of joints, and uh, we'd travel uh, east and west. Uh, and you'd drop off in Los Angeles, everybody would go their own way. So that's how I did it for a little while. And um, So was the brownie camera, was that the camera of the day, or was that the amateur camera of the day? Or No, that was the beginnings of my interest in photography. It was short-lived, and then I picked up a Pentax camera, uh, 35 millimeter, and I started just photographing on my own with no direction to, to roam, as Bob Dylan would say, and I was a rolling stone. Yeah. Uh, so um, I was broke, I was destitute, uh, I didn't have nowhere to turn, and a friend of mine from school, who was a social worker, said, let me introduce you to a man that may be able to help you with a job. And that man's name was Ed Bonilla, who was the mm -hmm. director of NAP, Neighborhood Adult Participation Project, which was uh, part of the Great Society of Lyndon Johnson. And uh, it was a storefront on 18th Street and Broadway in Lincoln Heights. And I went in to meet him and I had my camera around my neck. And uh, he looked at me and he was stroking his mustache and his goatee and he had on shades. He was, he was old school Chicano from uh, the Barrios, uh, but he was the director of NAP. And uh, he said, so um, you need a job? I said, yeah, I need a job. He says, and you're from New York. And I go, yeah, I'm from New York. He goes, uh-huh, okay. He says, you're, says, you're Puerto Rican. I go, uh, no, I'm not Puerto Rican. I said, well, yeah, I'm Puerto Rican by osmosis. And I'm Jewish, I'm Irish, I'm Italian. I'm all of those things that I grew up with in New York. I said, but my family is from Mexico. And he questioned me a little bit more. I was getting a little bit exasperated. And he says, and you need a job. I said, yeah, I need a job. <laughs> and he says, and he strokes his, beard, his goatee and he says, a Chicano from New York. That's an oddity. But it, I had never heard the word Chicano. Oh. I mean, this is my first entree. This is my first dance. And so I think to myself quickly, I said, Chicano, Mexicano, there's no difference. I said, yeah, I'm a Chicano from New York. And he goes, orale, you got the job. They say, uh, and I go, all right, great. Uh, what's the job? He says, you're going to organize the people. I said, right. how do you do that? He says, well, you show up tomorrow, you bring your camera with you, and we're going to start. Mm. And that next day, he parachuted me right into the middle of the whole emergent Chicano movement. He introduced me to Father Luz, Joe mm -hmm. Raso, Raul Riz, uh, Eliseo Risco, uh, a whole bunch of sub people, union members, union organizers, the whole beginnings of the Chicano movement. Is that 66 or still 65? That's late 66, 67. Okay. 
And so I'm on a fast track and the blowouts take place in the high schools and I begin photographing. Yeah, so let but me, now I, I, I begin photographing with a purpose. Okay, let me pause you there. I'm going to go back to Oscar. Oscar, go ahead. so you got the Brownie camera in 1966. You said that you went to Japan and that sparked your interest in uh, photography. Why the, why the little yeah. Brownie camera? Well, no, the Brownie was when I was in high school. That was a, high school. A, more like an Instamatic. I think it's a, it's, a different, it's a different camera, but similar. A Brownie was a larger camera. Instamatic was a, a little cassette camera. But when I came back from Japan, I, I, I had already gotten the bug to take pictures. And I had quite a, quite a background already in self-taught photography. And when I came back, I worked for the phone company for a little while and decided to go back to college instead of working a, a, a real job. And anyway, I, I started at Valley College and I met a lot of the, uh, at the time it was called UMAS. So I got involved in, you know, when you go to college, you want to get in with a fraternity or sorority. And this was uh, the Chicano version of, of, of a fraternity or sorority because it was both men and women. And at the time, uh, uh, I got involved with the uh, with the uh, UMAS, and and they were involved at the time with uh, with uh, electing uh, Tom Bradley. He was running for office. So uh, anyway, I got involved in political, uh, you know, um, events, and um, and I, I think that that was in '69, and that was actually the first time that I was involved in. Uh, that was when the um, the LAPD raided with the Panthers headquarters in South Central Los Angeles. So a friend of mine said, come on, let's go down. I mean, I hadn't heard about it. She said, she, that my friend had heard on the news. She said, let's go down there and see what's going on. So I went down there, took some photographs out, out of the window as, as my friend drove the car by the, 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 all the shooting had finished. So we just drove by and, sh and, and took some pictures, which are actually gonna be used it's amazing how, how things take a long time to, to gel, but those pictures are gonna be used by a, a lady who works with the African American Museum and they're doing a, a, a project on South Central. They're gonna be putting these kiosks. So they're gonna be shown on, on these kiosks in the street. But anyway, beyond that, I, I went on to Cal State Northridge, which at the time was uh, San Fernando Valley College and, and got to be known because I was always carrying my camera. And I started taking a Chicano studies and a, a art. I had a dual, a dual major. So it was, I was fortunate to, to meet uh, Rudy Acuna, who is a well-known historian. And he was in the process of writing some books. So he said, how would you like to be the photographer? I said, sure, absolutely. So it was a paying job. It was my first paying job as a photographer. And he gave me a script and I, and I went out and I shot the pictures and it was published and it was uh, used throughout the state of California, uh, uh, seventh through 12th grade in social studies. So from then on, I went on, I took a class in, um, uh, it sounds like I'm bragging, but this is my history. I, I took a class and uh, it was a, a group. Uh, we did a newspaper on campus. It's called El Popo. And the, uh, the uh, instructor was a, a graduate student named Frank Delomo, who later became a senior editor at the LA Times. And I think the, uh, the class advisor was Raul Reese. And he invited us to go visit the La Raza newspaper to see the facility. So I said, sure, why not? So I went down there and I, they had a dark room and I, I was interested. I mean, I really had the experience doing a newspaper so I, I got involved with them and uh and year would that be i'm sorry what year yeah um it, it would have had to be uh 70 because i was there i mean this was very fast track between 69 and 70 it was all happening like boom 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 right after the other and uh I, that's how i got in. I, I was there for some of the events which were the the moratoriums the 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 Catholicos por la Raza, which happened, I'd have to check my records, but it's either 69 or 70, I think 69. And then 70 was the moratoriums. And I was, I was not a permanent fixture at La Raza, but I was a kind of a visiting, 
photographer. I, I, I wasn't involved in the in the policy setting or anything. I was just taking pictures, and 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 occasionally my stories would get not my stories, but my photos would get published, and especially uh, the ones from the moratorium. And then I went off and, and worked for a semester. And right after the moratorium, I went to Crystal City, Texas and spent a semester there with Jose Angel Gutierrez. I came back and published um, augmented hit one of his articles with photographs that I took at the time. But anyway, from then on, it just kind of snowballed. I kept getting, I, I met people like Irene Blea later on in, in life and, and I, I'm very fortunate to work closely with a lot of scholars, historians, and uh, so my work has been kind of snowballing and I'm getting uh, a lot of people, well, people ask me for for my historical things. And uh, although I do other things, I do, you know, I, I exhibit as an artist, but the historical things are the events right. where my the art is like the cultural things, uh, working with the, at, I've worked with the Teatro Campesino. I've worked with uh, musicians. I've got to meet like, you know, El Chicano and Daniel Valdez and a lot of other people. I, I was fortunate to meet and photograph all the great, you know, like Corky Gonzalez, um, Tijerina, Bert Corona, um, uh, Dolores Huerta, uh, and, and, you know, and, and work with pe people like Mayor Bradley after he was elected. And so over the last 50 years, I've, I've been a professional photographer and worked in it in many aspects, commercially and historically and, 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 and for fun. Okay. So Luis, I hope that gets yeah, that, that's real. I think we could do a two hour show just on each one of you alone. <laughs> <laughs> Luis, so in 66, you, you uh, meet uh, Mr. Bonilla and he introduces you to all these folks. Was La Raza newspaper already in existence or was it in its formative stage? Uh, La Raza uh, newspaper was in existence. It started in September of uh, 1967. Okay. I, come, I come aboard a couple of issues later. Um, and uh, you, the lifespan of La Raza is 67 to 77. And so the uh, <clears throat> the the newspaper transitions into a magazine format in 1970. So we go from a 12 page uh, Gestetner printout uh, bilingual uh, with the use of uh, some photographic work and cartoon work and things like that. And it's out of the basement of the Episcopalian Church of Father Luce. And then we transition in, well, we have to move several times. So uh, when Oscar comes aboard, as he said in 1970, that's when we had made a move, a major move, and a, practically a final move to uh, City Terrace. And that's where we create uh, the dark room. We build it from scratch. Uh, we outfit it with uh, the latest printers and uh, enlargers, and you know we have it all set up. It's a, it's a professional run dark room, which uh, we created. I had learned how to do that with a, work that I had done with the, uh, another photographer who mentored me for about a year's time. So I learned the basics of darkroom work and uh, building a darkroom and uh, mixing chemicals and all of that, which is what we were doing with each other. We would pass on the information. We would educate each other. We would train each other. Many of us were self-taught. Uh, Oscar and I probably are the two, uh, Deborah Weber is another one uh, who stuck to camera work and it became part of our professional lives. Most everybody else, you know, did it, picked it up, dropped it for the most part, and had other gigs. But uh, for us, it became primary. And for me, it became a pathway into the larger media world because I transitioned from La Raza in 70, late 72, 73, into documentary filmmaking. Uh, ABC, NBC, other television stations. So. Uh, a pathway was set for me. Uh, right. Photography created a foundation for me and a base for me from which to grow. So, and, go ahead. Well, what was it like though in those early days of La Raza meeting, you know, Eliseer and Jose and all those folks? What was it like? I mean, what was what was the energy or lack of energy like 
you know, joining those group of people? Well, it was, it was formative. It was evolving. It was, uh, you know, uh, I think we were all learning at the same time. And it was meeting uh, a variety of people uh, from los de abajo, los, uh, los uh, to the academics, to the professionals, to uh, writers and poets and artists of all stripes who would come into the offices, especially there at uh, City Terrace. Uh, it was a, a hot spot for gathering. And so it was a salon. It was like 24 seven practically every day. And it was uh, also the base of uh, a lot of meetings and conferences and uh, strategy meetings and uh, how do we put it together? What's our next move? And then printing and working on uh, a magazine that is now 60 to 80 to 90 pages that goes from a local to regional to uh, a hemispheric publication. And so the scope of the magazine and the content of the magazine expands tremendously. Uh, so you're stepping into an environment where we're all creating. It's a creative process. Mm -hmm. It's an organizational tool primarily, but it's also a creative process for all of us. We have very little outlets for our talent, for our desires, for our, our political and cultural aspirations. So La Raza becomes, becomes a fountain for that. So did you see yourself as, as purely a, a person who shoots film or did you see yourself also as an activist, somebody who was involved in organizing, prompting, you know, those kinds of things? I saw myself as a photographer. I was yeah. not, at that time, I was not vocal. I was not a speaker. I was very shy. I spoke through my photographs. And my language was beginning to become more refined as I learned the craft of photography. Okay. I studied other photographers from Manuel Alvarez Bravo to Cartier-Bresson to uh, Akira Kurosawa to uh, any number of cinematographers and photographers of, of name, Dorothea Lange, uh, et cetera. And I'd go to the museums and study portraiture. I study the works of artists from the past to the present to see their composition, their framing. Uh, I taught myself the craft. Right. In order to dominate and understand the craft, which is technological, I had to understand how it worked. And so I involved myself that way. And that takes hold of my photography as you begin to study my work, you begin to see the evolution. Uh, you begin to see the evolution of each of the photographers of our fellow colleagues who are involved. Some evolve, others don't. Some always take out of focus shots and others take sharp <laughs> shots. You see what I mean? Right. Uh, so it, it's a process and you have to engage in the process. It's a discipline that requires constant work. What were some of the earliest events that you shot? You know, Ed Bonilla gave you uh, a job and he said, I'm gonna send you out to, you know, work with the people. What were some of the early events that you shot? Well, the first events was the, uh, the blowouts uh, in the school and the walkouts and the Board of Education and the sit-ins and Sal Castro. So within my files, uh, both at UCLA and at home, uh, are hundreds and hundreds of photographic images from that period of time, many of which have never been seen before. Um, that's one. And then you got to remember, and I'm always amazed at how on a weekly, on a daily basis, the organizing was going on, demonstrations were going on, uh, whether it be educational issues, immigration issues, police brutality issues, war issues, uh, and any host of other subject matter that uh, were unfolding and whatever organizations took it on or whatever combination of organizations that banded together to, uh, uh, to bring it to the forefront, it, it was constant, uh, much like what's going on today. When you look at what's going on today, it's constant protests, it's right. constant demonstrations, it's constant vocal outrage uh, to the systemic oppression that's going on. Well, it was the same thing back then for us. Now, the civil rights movement in general was going on throughout the country, throughout the world for that matter. Uh, you know, Vietnam War brought an international uh, uprising, if you will, 
And uh, you begin to look at it from that point of view. I didn't come into this polit politicized. I came into it with a sense of politics from my childhood with my father, who always used to curse out the pinche gringos, metiéndose donde no se deben de meter, mm -hmm. you know? And so I had a sense of it. So the formulation, though, and the sophistication of it is a slow evolvement as I become more and more involved and more engaged. And I begin to start connecting the dots. And photography helps do that for me. So photography gives me a base. It gives me a foundation. Un razón de ser, you know? Um, I was, uh, you know, th that was the era of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and I was into all of it, you know? <laughs> and so uh, trying to find my footing and say, okay, uh, who am I? What am I in this world? What's my purpose? What's my razón de ser? Well, photography became that. The Chicano movement became that. I was reborn. Fue un renacimiento para mí. Right. Oscar. Yes. So in 1970, you get introduced to La Raza. Do you cover the first uh, two, uh, what I call pre-moratorium, pre-major moratorium uh, marches? Did you cover any of those two? Yes, I did. I, I covered the one which was started at the uh, Cinco Puntos at the Veterans Memorial there in, at, in, East, in uh, Boyle Heights went down to, uh, I think it's called, uh, I forget, Obregon Park. And then the one the moratorium in the rain, I covered that one. Okay. And then I covered, those Those were, I mean, those, I did those independently. And then I, I really didn't hook up with with uh, with La Raza people till, till the moratorium. Okay. And, uh, um, but, uh, so there, when you, my, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you cover that at the behest of La Raza or were you still independent? Which one? The, the last one, the major one. Well, I, I, I always considered myself independent because I, I, I was not official. Uh, I, I don't know what the, uh, you know, protocol was. I don't know if you had to get sworn in or whatever. <laughs> I say that jokingly, but I, it was all, I know everybody was volunteer and I would, I would come and come and go. And I mean, they had, used to have staff meetings and I attended a couple, but, but I, I didn't really get assignments per se. Uh, I don't know how that worked. I al always considered myself a freelancer. And, uh, and but I did, when I left, um, I did leave my files on the more, that, that one moratorium with them. And, um, and also the event, which was called the Marcha de Justicia. And those images have been uh, safely kept for over 40 years. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a vault somewhere, but uh, recently were released and were then documented uh, and archived at UCLA. So then they were able to come out to the public, which they would come out and, you know, to see the day of light. But, um, but so that what was were, kind of... In, in preparation for the Chicano Moratorium on August 29th, what were the expectations? What was the buzz of the community? What was you know, what were people talking about as they were preparing for the march? Um, I, I don't think anybody expected the outcome. I think everybody was very up and very, you know, very festive about it. Uh, although it was a kind of a negative subject, you know, the, the Vietnam War and, and, and protesting against the, the, uh, the uh, um, lopsided, um, uh, you know, death figures and, and, and injuries to Hispanics versus uh, what, what we're calling Chicanos versus the, the non-Hispanic. I think in Vietnam, it was extremely high, uh, maybe as high as 20%. I have the, I have the uh, but anyway, I, they were hoping to, I mean, I feel, I didn't really have much contact with say the Brown Berets or the organizers, but in general, I, I was in that, you know, circle of people that, that were, that were activists at the time. But I, I think they wanted to just basically bring this to the forefront. And I think one of the problems was that the media uh, did not cover our point of view uh, or the Chicano point of view. And I think it exists to this day. I don't think there's been much change. They do cover a kind of token uh, Chicano or Hispanic events, but very they, they ginger coat it uh, and it's very, uh, very, you know, lopsided, you know, I mean, you see it, I mean, I, I hate to compare it, although it's, you know, what's happening now is the, the you know, Black Lives Matter, but minorities in, in a, 
are always thrown in in a in a in a bad light. But anyway, your question was, what were the the goals? No, kind of. My my goal was just to yeah, just to take pictures and and document some of the things that were happening. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, uh, some uh, some slide um, that'll appear on your screen, and then talk to me about what it was you were documenting. And why you chose to do, you know, some of the shots that you did. So let me go to share screen, and I'm going to go to um, let's use this. Okay, maybe I won't be doing that. <laughs> Here you go. Uh, let me do share screen again. Um, and we'll go from there. So where did where did the where did the march? What was the starting point of the of the march? The march started at a point which is uh, on Third Street in in East Los Angeles, Third near, uh, I believe it's. Uh, Dittman, and which is now the they call the uh, East Los Angeles Civic Center, but that's also the, the point. There is a, now a uh, there's a park there, and that was a staging area, and they walked east towards Atlantic, and then south on Atlantic to Whittier, and then west on Whittier to south to um, um, Laguna Park, which is, it was called then. And I, I marched along with them all all the way and 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 took pictures, and and was and was uh, became aware that of course this was a, a standard procedure, but there was many plainclothes policemen as uh, also with uh, there was you know clothed policemen obviously there, but since I had been involved, hello. <laughs> no, that that's not your image. I'm trying to. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. This is. I think this is. Um, this after is. The, the, I, yes. The aftermath. So let me do right. stop screen. Let me do stop sharing and then see if I could do it again. Uh, we were lamenting the fact that we now have to do um, learn how to do um, uh, different different stuff, uh, and sometimes we know how to do it, and sometimes we do not. There it is, right there. Uh, and now let me see if I could share screen and then go from the beginning. Okay, so that was this. Was this the front of the march? I don't see anything, but I'm assuming it is the front of the march. It's okay. uh, it says National Chicano Moratorium East Los. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't see it. I don't know if there's something wrong. Let me try it again. I don't see it. But yes, that was a staging area. Luis, do you see that? Nope, I don't. You okay. know, in fact, in fact, I don't see myself uh, when you're addressing me or when I'm addressing uh, the, the the question that you ask. Yeah, the person that speaks is is the uh, image that comes up, and then right. a after somebody finishes speaking, then the next person who speaks, they they will come up. I know, but I I, I don't come up when I've been speaking. I don't see myself. Okay, oh, no, I, you I see it now. I see it now, but. Okay, so let me see if I can go to the beginning of of the slide of the presentation as opposed to if we're soon. It's the it's the one more time. I learned how to do a, a crash course on this, but apparently the crash course wasn't well wasn't enough. When when you're speaking, you come up. When Oscar is speaking, he comes up on screen. When I'm yeah, speaking, I don't come up on screen. You you wouldn't. Oh, I wouldn't. Why no, not? you wouldn't. You would be a little square on the on the right hand side. I'm on the left hand side of my okay. screen. Okay, you would be a, an, in a little square. Oh, is that uh, then? Uh, oh, okay. All right. Mm. I mean, not that I want anybody to see my wonderful face, but oh, you know. Um, <laughs> Well, you 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 have that you have that DJ voice, you know. <laughs> Stay tuned for another exciting chapter. There, there you go. You have that voice right there. Like Chico Sesma. Remember Chico Sesma? Way, well, no, he was way before my time. Oh, but, I I could tell you stories there. Okay. 
<laughs> he was way before my time. So let, let's try this again, Oscar. Oh, right here. All right. Okay. Did you, do you see that image? No, but it is. Okay. There it is. There I, it is. I, I, I see it there. Okay, I see it. Okay. Yes, this was, well, yeah, so, well, this was along the march at some point along the march. I'm, I'm, I couldn't say exactly where. Um, at some point between uh, Third Street and, and Laguna Park. But I so couldn't there appeared to be a variety of different ages involved in this march. Did, did you right. notice that? Right, right. Uh, I, I, the, in some of the, uh, I mean, there was people there, there was mothers carrying children, there was older people, there was a lot of college students. Uh, they have these, you know, very uh, conservative people like this, the Mexican American uh, Political Association, MAPA. And, uh, and so we had, there was a lot of support from people coming from as far away as Texas. This was one of my schoolmates at college, Abel. I forget his last name, but he, he caught him there sitting with the, the poster on uh, against the war in Vietnam. Yeah, our fight is but, in the barrio, uh, not Vietnam. Yes, and then this was uh, this was on Atlantic, and you can see obviously it says uh, Nixon no Chicano si a paz. So there's it. This was on Atlantic Boulevard. Yeah, th these look to be like 10, 11, 12 year olds. Yes, yes, they seem to be uh, pre-teens or early teens. Uh, and there's a lot of support from, from the younger people. And, and then this is the a brown beret. Well, I don't know if she's an actual brown beret, but was she wearing the brown beret and a brown sash and, and helping carry the banner. And this was on Atlantic. And then we have the other a group. This, is, this has gotten a lot of, a lot of usage on, on book covers, a couple of book covers and books, but this is a, you know, uh, late teens to early 20s and, and an older man there on the, on the right with a, wearing a sarape, sarape vest. And then they got the, the you know, the guy with a couple guys with the bare chest, but and then the women and their, and their uh, folklorico blouse and uh, more contemporary. So I, I I, I like to show the cultural, the, the cross-cultural th within the culture. And there's a mom with her son, and maybe she's a grandma, I don't know. But there's a little boy there, a, a girl in the back with a flag, and her her husband pushing their their baby. This one is a lady very uh, uh, with her child. And you, you notice the UFW flag is, is prominent now. Uh, during this march. I mean, there were a couple of slides right. where you saw uh, uh, either some handmade posters or actual uh, red flags with uh, UFW. Was right. that was that symbol uh, prominent throughout the entire march or was it isolated? No, I think it was prominent throughout the march because the, there was a lot of cross support. I mean, people not only supported the anti-war movement, but they supported the uh, the farm worker movement and the rights of the farm worker for, for equal pay and e you know uh, 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 living conditions. Um, so Cesar Chavez was very uh, very well supported amongst the the activists at the time. So I think you know. People were doing, uh, you know, they were doing double duty. They were supporting the anti-war movement and, and supporting the uh, the farm worker movement. So I, I think those two things went hand in hand. And then here you see a, a tele con Coors. So people are also boycotting Coors, which was uh, un apparently, uh, um, you know, in, in bad with the community. You have a, a youngster there with his dad and the lady in the back, you know, the... Um, Everybody very, very up. And there's a reference to Che, Che Guevara in the background because there was a, a pro, there was a, a support for the, uh, for Che especially and, and for the Cuban, the liberation of Cuba. Uh, so there was a lot of, there was multiple things happening. And here you have the, the, uh, the reference to, to, Somebody in being killed in Vietnam, the, the uh, Sanchez, the name of a of a fallen uh, uh, a soldier over in, in Vietnam. Yeah, some of the bad parts about coming, you know, fighting in Vietnam and coming back is that there were covenants that did not allow Chicanos to be buried in white cemeteries. So yes, even though yes, 
Yeah, I, I know when I was in Texas, uh, there was a, I think that the GI Forum was, came about because of that, because uh, there was not, a, they were, would not allow um, somebody from the World War II to be buried. But in, 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 in Crystal City, I, I have pictures at a, at a Panteón Benito Juárez, which was cr created because they wouldn't allow uh, Hispanics to be buried in their Anglo Cemetery. And this is after the, uh, the violence at, at um, Laguna Park. And the, the the line of deputies, they're clearing the street. And after a while, I mean, they would pretty much leave the photographers alone. But then after we published photographs, they, I, I, I had to do some fast running on a couple of occasions. <laughs> the, the gentleman, the, the, the deputy on the right holding the, uh, the, the tear gas weapon, that's the one that shot um, um, uh, Ruben Salazar. And then the one in the middle is carrying a, a gas a generator, which uh, was used to spray people to clear the uh, Laguna Park. So the but, guy, so the guy on the right is the actual guy that shot the canister into the Silver Dollar Cafe that that killed Ruben Salazar. Yes, if I, if I remember correctly, I, I have a closer up shot of him, but it hasn't appeared yet in the uh, in the in the missing negatives from. Uh, from the, the Rasa magazine, but this was at this was at the Laguna Park, and I and uh, and there he is again, right there. And this is right there in the adjacent street. They were going, they were shooting, and they were they were uh, going after people right in their front yards and and uh, shooting tear gas. And. As I say, at, at first they left me. They left me alone. Maybe they thought I was a press photographer. But later on, on the 16th of September, I was actually chased, um, in, in, on a couple of occasions, uh, by uh, very aggressively by deputies. I I, I have to make a, a a note, kind of apologizing for the quality of the of the photograph. Normally, we would develop our own film, but in this case. Uh, somebody else developed it, so it. it I'm, I'm not complaining, but it's less than, you know, the, less than a quality. But it has a lot of grain, but still, it 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 gets the message across. But there's a when you develop film, you have to be aware of temperatures and agitation and all that kind of stuff. And some of the people, as Luis said, I mean, some of them were were mentored by other people, and some people, you know, took it on themselves to process their own film and if there was any any handy I mean there's something that hadn't been processed they would you know they would do each, us a favor and process it but this one I, I did not process. So this appears to be the park and after it was cleared. Well it was in the process of being cleared I think the main the main group of of, of, of marchers that are gone and you can see all the the litter and and they're still tr they're dry, trying to maintain their the ground that they had uh, already cleared. It is, and it, there's all, was also reports of several people being beaten up with batons. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, on some there were some videographers there. Some there's there's evidence of people being. Uh, I know one woman in particular, Viviana Chamberlain. It it shows a depth. She was standing in the middle of the park and he came up behind her and just gave her a, a tremendous blow to the back of her head and she just kind of dropped. But but that's that's the kind of uh, the things that were happening. Now here is an LA Times um, and whose photos did they use for the LA Times coverage? Well, the the top two and the, bo and the bottom left were by uh, Joe Rosso and, and Raul Reese. They were both together in front of the silver dollar. The one of the deputy over here on the on the bottom right, that's that's mine. Yeah. And, uh, and then inside they use other people's. But we we didn't claim personal credit. We just gave it to the to the uh, magazine. So Luis, let's go to you. So you were not at the Chicano Moratorium. <laughs> And because you were uh, attending to your mom. Uh, tell me, what did you know about the planned events at the moratorium 
And then when did you come back and what did you see as, an, as the as aftermath of that? I had left uh, Los Angeles several days before the moratorium. Um, my mother was undergoing a operation, a cancer operation. We did not know if she was going to survive. So it was a difficult decision, but uh, you know, I had to be with my mother. So I flew back to New York to attend to my mother and uh, see that uh, hopefully she would survive, which she did. I, and she outlived the doctors, uh, which uh, <laughs> after they gave her a week to live or a day to live or a month to live, and uh, she lived long after the doctors passed away. I returned back to LA within the week after talking with Joe and Raul and several others on the phone. Uh, when I saw the news uh, come up uh, uh, in New York City. And so I returned within the week and got back uh, into the dark room and started uh, doing the work necessary to start printing up images and prepare the special edition issue that came out with the images of, uh, that Joe and Raul took of uh, the silver dollar. And uh, those images that you saw in the LA Times, as uh, Oscar pointed out, were, uh, were from, uh, from Raul and Joe, uh, who did not know, here's a side note, that they did not know that Ruben Salazar was inside the Silver Dollar Cafe. Oh. They had seen the gathering of the sheriffs in front of the Silver Dollar, and so they just made their way through the crowds and the police uh, sheriffs uh, to the silver dollar and they positioned themselves on either side of the corner and started photographing, not knowing that Ruben Salazar was inside. They did not know it until later on that evening when the news came out saying that Ruben Salazar had been killed. And that's when they looked at each other and they said, we got to develop the film and realized that they had captured that moment. And so that moment rings and resonates throughout our community, resonates within national media, and goes international. So La Raza magazine, through Joe and Raul, capture uh, and document a historic moment that nobody else captured. And so La Raza gets international recognition, <laughs> where nobody else was there. No other photographers were there that captured that imagery. It was just Joe and Raul, which is ironic because that catapults La Raza magazine into more prominence. And uh, it gives uh, uh, validity to the work that we were doing in terms of the pushback, uh, pushback of the information, the, uh, the contents and the imagery and the, uh, the editorials and the, the, all the work that was contained within the uh, magazine. Uh, so we take on uh, an added aura uh, within the CPA, the Chicano Press Association, which is made up of uh, uh, several hundreds of uh, newspapers throughout the Southwest up into the Midwest. Um, and so <clears throat> we are predominant in terms of being uh, magazine, uh, photographically driven. And as Oscar was saying, you know, uh, in many cases, the, the photographers never got photographic credit. Uh, that was just part of the way we did things back then. Uh, unless you had a photo layout that was specific to you. Manuel Barreda had that, I had that, and a couple of other people. Uh, Maria Marquez had that. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we try to do sections for the photographers to get the recognition. And the only recognition that people received, because it was non-paying, it was all volunteer, was at the end where you would get credits, you know, for participating, whether it was just for that publication or whether you were there constantly. Uh, it was all volunteer work. No one got paid. Uh, so it was a love of labor. And people came and went, it was a revolving door, but there was a core group of us. And amongst the photographers, there was a core group of us, uh, which uh, led to, uh, and that's a whole other subject that I'm sure you're gonna jump into when we put the La Raza exhibition together. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's representative of uh, the work that we did back then. And there's a lot of what we call staff photographers mm -hmm. because we have not been able to identify who took the photographs, which is part of the task that we're undertaking still to this day now. We have, I've counted about 35 to 40,000 images uh, 
we at first thought it was like 20, 25,000, but I've been through the, <laughs> through the collection several, close to a dozen times because I had to curatorially to put the exhibition together. And so it's taken me all this time to become familiar with each of the photographers and their work. Um, and it's, it's with truly a, a deep sense of respect that I have for my fellow colleagues and the work that they have done. Uh, so, so what was the atmosphere like after the moratorium? The atmosphere was tense. It was extremely tense. Um, you know, we were under constant surveillance. Uh, the office got busted into several times by LAPD. Uh, you know, you'd leave the office and, uh, you know, you'd have a squad car following you. And you, you wouldn't know if you got home or not. Sometimes you'd be stopped, you'd be harassed, uh, or you'd be picked up. And, you know, that, that was part of it. Right. Uh, like Oscar was saying, uh, you know, there were times when you, you had to run. And there were more than many times that I had to run uh, with my camera, jumping fences and hiding in houses and trying to get away from uh, police that were chasing me and uh, some of the others. We were, we were identified. They had, our, they had us. They had us pinned. They knew who we were. They would harass us. They would park outside of our offices. They'd come in. We had a first name basis with many of them. Uh, LAPD, undercover, whatever they were. Uh, you always smelled them. You always knew who they were. And in fact, we used to tell them, you know, you should give 10% to the cause. And they would say, what cause? They say, cause you got a job because of us. That's why. <laughs> I said, otherwise you'd be washing dishes down at Skid Row. That's right. So, you know, so that was the reaction of the photographers. How did the community react to uh, the, the, you know, the aftermath of the moratorium? Well, it, uh, it, you know, it, it's like what's happening now. It doesn't dampen the spirit. They encabronas. You know, you, 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 you just get so, uh, you get so enraged with, uh, uh, with the response from uh, uh, the powers that be in government and within the LAPD and within the sheriff's department or within whatever, FBI, CIA, or all those, you know, I mean, we're, we're on file. They had us on file. I should, I, outside my home, they'd be parked and they'd come up to the house, you know, they'd, uh, you know, talk to my mother about me, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we went through a lot of harassment. It was constant. It, it, it never stopped. So you know, were the, there uh, more marches and more protests after that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it was constant. That's why I'm saying I'm, I'm, I'm truly amazed and respectful of uh, how the people turned out. Uh, the more suppression that came, the more outrage that was done. And weekly, the constant uh, demonstrations. So many, I, I, I can't even identify uh, any number of them. You know, some of them stand out and many of them don't because I just lost track of them. But we try to photograph as many as we could. You know, not all of us were there at the same time. That's one of the things that we're doing with the archive is that we look at the period of time that the photographs represent uh, who is it that specifically was there and who was not there, uh, who was part of the magazine at that time and who was not part of the magazine. So it's a process of, of uh, tracing each of the photographers and their history with the photographic work that was done. So this is where you begin to narrow it down to, okay, this batch of photographs belongs to this photographer, right. we concede, you know. Before we talk about the January uh, 1971 uh, protest, there was a question, Oscar. Um, yes. How are you earning a living? I mean, you're a photographer. Is did you have a day job? Well, back in those days, I was a, a full-time student uh, from '69 to about '73, and I, I I was living on the GI Bill. I was getting a stipend for, for military service, but I, I did have a job as a, in a drugstore. I, I was delivering uh, prescriptions. And then, and then I, I was a, a counselor at, at, at the university. I was a peer counselor for a little while. And then actually I got a job with the, with the state of California working in the, because of 
the Chicano studies major kind of qualified me for social studies major. And I, I was recommended for a job with the state of California for, for a while uh, with the Department of Unemployment. But, uh, and then after that, I, I, um, when I left college, I worked for a while with Jesus Trevino at KCET as a production assistant and worked with him and Luis Reese. And we, that's how I got to meet a lot of people like the Teatro Campesino and, uh, and, and other, you know, political uh, people. But that, after I left there, I left KCT, I went to work for, for Cal Poly Pomona with Vera, who, who's in the audience here. I was there for a little while at, at Cal Poly Pomona as a production assistant. And then I went on to Cal State LA as a as a as a produ production um, uh, consultant. But but all the time um, I had photography as a free. I would do it freelancing, and I never really be, got a full time job as a photographer until 1986. And I worked. I mean, that's getting way 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 over this side of the moratorium. But I worked for 20 years as a city photographer for the city of Pico Rivera. So I got to work with the city uh, in, in, in all capacities. I would document all the events, all the political stuff, city council meetings. And I got to meet, it's ironic, but I got to meet uh, Sheriff Baca when he was sheriff at the time. And, and, and uh, anyway, uh, that's another story. But, but I worked there for 20 years and I retired and so I'm not retired and I, I still do freelance work. Okay. But I never, in terms of the, 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 the political stuff, it was, all, it was all out of my own, you know, it was on my own. I, I was never paid to do that stuff. I, it was there just out of a, a feeling that I needed to do that. So it was not, it was not like somebody said, here, go photograph these, uh, these uh, demonstrations. It was all on, it was all on me. Mm -hmm. So, I, Luis. I, yeah. Yes, sir. So, Luis, how did uh, did you have a daytime job, or did you just earn money off your photography? No, I've never earned money off of my photography uh, until recently. Um, only, <laughs> actually, only over the past <laughs> decade. Uh, it was a love of labor for me, uh, beginning with La Raza magazine, uh, but then I segued into documentary filmmaking. Uh, and doing a show called Reflexiones for KBC TV. It was a half hour show that we used to do every other week. We would alternate with a black themed show uh, called I Am Somebody. And um, that was the time when the doors were kicked open and uh, we were allowed in to do public affairs uh, programming. Uh, so uh, that was my introduction into the television media. But it also introduced me to uh, the, um, the lack of diversity within the television media and the larger media in general, to which Oscar referred to earlier, uh, which is so true to this day. I mean, we have more uh, coverage, we have more representation, but nowhere near uh, the coverage and uh, media coverage that we should be receiving for the portion of the population that we represent. Especially since uh, we're forty nine percent. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, you got to consider that when when I entered into uh, in nineteen seventy two, mid seventy two, late seventy two, I entered and started the half an hour show. Um, Jesus Trevino was the only other one at KCET, and then there was a couple of newscasters, uh, Henry Alfaro, and uh, a couple of others. Their names escape me now. Who had uh, uh, more or less a sit down, uh, you know, two cameras set up uh, Q&A in studio. Um, I took the approach of wanting to make uh, cinematic uh, programs and uh, we'd go out and we'd shoot and we'd create a story. And regardless of what the subject matter was, uh, which ironically for me started, uh, my first show was uh, Ricardo Chavez Ortiz who hijacked the uh, airplane from Arizona to LA. And the very first day that uh, I come in to, to start work on this program, uh, 
Ricardo Chavez Ortiz uh, hijacks the plane, and that becomes my first story. Uh, Chon Noriega has uh, my uh, historical video files uh, over at UCLA. He managed to salvage all of the programs from Reflexiones. There are some 30, 40 uh, programs that I did along with uh, several other colleagues, Susan Racho, Tony Rodriguez, uh, David Garcia, uh, and a couple of other people, Andres Chavez, uh, who has passed away. Um, but we did a body of work, uh, for better or worse, you know, uh, we gave it our best shot and uh, we did it cinematically. We did it uh, to tell a story and oftentimes we'd create theatrical stories. Uh, Flores Magón or the indigenous movements, uh, AIM, and Boricuas and uh, Prop 22 and any number of other subjects that uh, were popping up at the time. So that become a further escalation of my work within the media. And that introduces me to any number of other people within the larger media. That's how I come to meet Margot Albert at uh, Plaza de la Raza. And uh, I begin to start working with her at Plaza de la Raza as a cultural arts center, and one of the first that just celebrated its 50th anniversary. So I become involved with Plaza and with Margot and we're doing uh, we're doing one hour specials, we're doing theatrical work, we're doing any number of projects. Uh, she opens up the door and I come in and she throws me uh, <laughs> into producing, directing, writing and doing what I've never done before, but what's new? <laughs> I always seem to be parachuted into these situations, you know, so you take it, you run with it and you do the best you can. Isn't it amazing how successful one can become when you stumble through life because nobody has done it before. No one has shown you how to do it. You just happen to be at the right place at the right time. And you know, you, you work your way through it. You may not have the necessary skills, but you pick them up, you adapt, and then you go forward. I mean, yes. that, that, seems, to, that seems to be a, a whole group. There's a whole group of Chicanos that, that if there was a description of their life, that would be it. Well, uh, uh, yes, absolutely. And it certainly applies to me. Uh, after my father died, I brought my mother out to California, here to Los Angeles, and she lived with me for a while. Uh, and uh, she'd watch me working late into the middle of the night and she'd uh, stop at the kitchen door and she'd look at me and she'd go, Ay, mijo, you work so hard, but you don't make no money. You should, beca <laughs> you should become a dentist. They never run out of teeth. <laughs> And I go, I'd say, thank you, mom. Thank you, mom. And uh, I think to myself, damn, is it too late to become a dentist? It, it's too late. <laughs> it's so, too late. Exactly. Exactly. My path was set, you know, for better or worse. <laughs> yeah. So let's go back then. So the, there's a series then of, of protests and, and just day, daily outrage at the killing of Ruben Salazar and the other two individuals who were uh, killed at uh, the Chicano Moratorium. There was a march in January of 71 that you documented. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to see, using Sapo Technica, I'm going to see if I can uh, put that one up, and then we can talk about those uh, images. Okay, I'm trying. Somebody put a real nice comment, said, in this day and age with technology, we have to be very forgiving. That, that is very true. So I appreciate that comment. So <laughs> this one, I decided to use this as, as the very first slide because uh, this is the uh, catalog of the art exhibit that was curated by yourself and Amy Scott. Uh, so I wanted to start there and, and we will later on talk about your efforts, but I just wanted to uh, show folks that all the artwork, I'm sorry, all the photography of La Raza was in fact on display physically and online and that there's going to be that uh, uh, um, catalog. Is it available now or is it going to be available for sale? Um, the catalog is available. I can't see the screen. The screen is black. Ah, okay. How about now? Still, I don't have anything. Uh, Oscar, do you see a screen? No, it's black. It says you're, you're sharing a screen, but there's nothing there. Okay, let's let's try it one more time. Where is there a 12-year-old when you need one? <laughs> let's try it again. Uh, okay. 
Maybe you should take that music break. You were going to put a little... <laughs> well, the music. Yeah, let, 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 let's do that. Let, let's take, a, let's take a, a, a two song music break. That's good. All right. Not two song, but dos songs. Okay. Let me get a glass of wine. Bueno, pues, Cubo, ¿cómo les va? Qué lindo día para cantar noticias que han llegado en Nuevo México, 1848. Pues fue firmado el gran tratado de Guadalupe Hidalgo. Prometiendo justicia y libertad.
cause for the cause. Uh, so can, can uh, Luis, can you see the image? Yes, I can. Okay. So uh, as I talked about, uh, this uh, catalog you said is now available for purchase. Yes, um, the catalog comes out post exhibition, which is ironic. Uh, <clears throat> and I think serendipity, uh, the exhibition ended after a year and a half run from 2017 to 2019, February 10th. And <clears throat> the catalog just came out uh, late January, February. Um, I haven't done to go revisions and rewrites and all of the things that uh, go with putting this thing together, um, which actually turned out to be a good thing uh, because it's revived uh, the exhibition and keeps the exhibition alive in the memory of people. And it has won, um, just a couple of months ago, it won the International IPP, uh, International Publication Book Awards in the area of US history which according to John Noriega is a first. Uh, it's never happened for a museum catalog to do that. And for UCLA, it was kudos. Um, <clears throat> and recently over the past couple of weeks, it's been nominated in four categories by the International Latino Book Awards. Another first, it's never happened for a catalog and to have four nominations for one book. So it speaks to, uh, well, it speaks to the speaks to the good work that was done, <laughs> and uh, you know, kudos to all of my fellow colleagues and all that were involved with uh, putting the catalog together, uh, from UCLA Chicano Studies to Autry to my fellow photographers. Um, this we will not be intimidated is taken at Laguna Park, January thirty first, nineteen seventy one. Uh, Oscar was there as well, and a few of the other photographers. Um, this image, it's early morning. You can see the fog in the background. Uh, and there's just this line of students just marching forward. And uh, this is just one of a series of images. You got to remember that every image taken, there's before and after images that were taken, or at least as many as possible. Sometimes it's just a one up. Uh, this is uh, the beginnings of the renaming or the desire to rename uh, Laguna Park, uh, uh, Ruben Salazar Memorial Park. Uh, the Teatro Campesino Calaveras are in the background and uh, they have just given a presentation. They're marching along with all the uh, fellows uh, marches uh, towards Laguna Park. And again, this is just a series of uh, photographs that's uh, several rolls of film that I took on uh, this event. Is that, uh, is that Daniel Valdez on the left-hand side in the white shirt? And uh... Yes, that's Daniel, that's Daniel. So Teatro Campesino came in and uh, this is uh, at the park itself, uh, part of the demonstration. And uh, this is, uh, again, just a part of the series, but uh, the use of, uh, the peace sign and uh, the very creative ways that uh, uh, the young uh, uh, women uh, uh, phrased and made their posters and their banners and uh, the dedication and the seriousness of uh, everyone that was there, uh, the commitment. Uh, and there were thousands, there were thousands all over the place. And this was, uh, la, this was La Marcha por la Justicia, and this was against police brutality that was taking place, because they were knocking us off. Uh, if, uh, if, you, if they got you and they took you to jail, you, you, you weren't sure if you were going to come out of jail. There were so many, quote unquote, suicides that took place. What I love about this photo is the youngsters. I mean, you know, uh, Chicano students, uh, high school students, college students always play just a a big gigantic role in the movement, whether it be the blowouts or everything else. And as I look at this photograph, I only see maybe three adults, three people who I, you know, can, can guess are over the age of, of 18, but everybody else seems to be just like youngsters and students, man. It's just, uh, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. Mm. Um, well, this one speaks for itself. Um, and 
again, it, it's so applicable to what we're going through today. Don't, don't make a joke of your rights. Right. You know, it's a uh, past is present and is future. Um, the commitment that people put themselves on the line, that they were willing to take the body blows, that they were willing to fight back, that they were willing to step up and organize. And uh, this was also, this is the beginning of, uh, as Oscar was pointing out to his other image of, uh, of August 29th, there's a militarization process that's going on and you can see it. And here you have a BAR, uh, a Vietnam a weapon, uh, tear gas canisters, and uh, they're loaded, they're ready. And it's just all over the place. And uh, they're coming after us, they're live rounds. There's no, there's no pellets, there's no uh, rubber bullets, uh, you know, no. It's amazing to me that 50 years later, uh, um, we get the same, we get the same um, treatment we get, you know, you ask for rights, you ask for something, you ask for equality, you demand change, and and the response is not, hey, let's sit out, let's sit down at the table, and try to work this out. The response in 1970, 1971, to 2020, the response is the same, which is overhanded response, and this image can be transplanted you know, to what's happening in a variety of different states in the, you know, military Humvees, the military outfits, the military weapons, the AR-15s. Uh, it seems that we haven't learned in 50 years how to sit down at the table and talk about differences and how to reach an agreement about change. It seems that we're always dealing with this response right here. And I think that this image and even this image just speaks to the response that we continually get. Well, it, it goes back further than just 50 years. A colonial empire does not negotiate with its subjects. And much of the literature is out there. We are subjects. We are colonized, all right? The pushback that we see going on today dates back to the foundation, to found, founding and expansion of the empire all right that that's just fact that's Texas the rangers california rangers absolutely Robert. absolutely uh, you, you, you're negotiating you don't negotiate with the empire the empire doesn't negotiate and if you do you negotiate on their terms and their terms are brute force this is uh gustav montag the killing, the death of Gustav Montag. This is a series of photographs. The Brown Beret there is a medic by the name of Richard Soto, uh, who is established. Uh, uh, he comes out of uh, Sa uh, the Sakura area. I don't have the I don't have the information in front of me, but um, there's a series of shots uh, where they carry the body of Gustav Montag, and they lay him down. He's dying. He's he's just dying. And they're waiting for an ambulance, which, you know, takes forever to come. And uh, the irony of it is uh, when you go to the next image of Raul placing the flag on him, uh, this is at the site where he gets killed. And Raul is placing the Mexican flag on him symbolically uh, to identify him as Chicano, uh, whom we thought was Chicano. But we came to find out later uh, when the police said that he was not Mexican American, uh, that he had a Slavic name, so therefore he must be a communist agitator who came to stir up the masses. And then they recanted and pulled back that, uh, uh, and said that, no, he was just a Jewish kid from the Boyle Heights area who had come to observe. And he caught a, a spray of shotgun pellets that ricocheted off of a wall right next to him and that took him out. But the thing about this photograph also is, which always strikes me, is that if you look at his, his feet, his shoes, his feet are sticking out of the soles, both soles of his shoes. 
And I said, how poor is this kid? He's got to be very poor that he doesn't even have. I, I remember Papa used to put cardboard in, in your soul when you got holes in your shoes, you know, uh, not even cardboard. He's just, his feet are sticking out through the soles of his shoes. I see the pobre estaba. And Raul was placing the flag on him. And he was just an innocent bystander. He came to watch. And así pasó. And that would happen. You know, you never know when you were going to get hit. Right. And, um, this is downtown LA. And it was Mecha students that had gathered from various colleges and universities, and they were marching. And uh, te digo, this beautiful Chicanita caught my eye. I, I think you uh, date this in 72, right? Somewhere around there, yeah. 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 And this one is actually a throwback. This went back to 1968. Yeah, this is... Um, this is uh, um, the March on the Board of Education. This is the beginnings of the sittings uh, on the Board of Education. And, now, historically, uh, historically, this is when Sal Castro was removed as a teacher and there were eff uh, efforts to uh, retain him as a result of uh, his being arrested uh, for his participation in the blowouts along with 12 other Chicanos. They, uh, the school board um, released him from employment. Yeah. And then there were a series of actions to uh, try to get him back. For example, you see the sign back there that says, retain Sal Castro Lincoln High. Um, so this was the march uh, towards the uh, School Board of Education. <laughs> yeah, now, if you look on the far left-hand side of the uh, image, you'll see that bearded man with the dark shades. Yes, sir. That's Ed Bonilla. Ah, okay. That's the man who flips my worldview. He's the man who introduces me, says, bring your camera. And then in the middle, right behind the American flag is Alicia Sandoval. Uh, I believe that's her name, Alicia Sandoval. Uh, uh, Oscar? Uh, yes, you... yes, that, yes, that is her. Okay, so she had a television program uh, as well. And she was a school teacher and she was extremely active. And uh, the man with this in the front with the tie and suit is, uh, Oscar, you remember his name? Yeah, yeah his name was Vahak Mardarosian. Yeah, there you go. And he was head of the EICC, Educational Issues Coordinating Committee, um, which was uh, organizing all these protests, uh, education, and were negotiating with the Board of Education people, of which Julian Nava was a member of. So, so uh, real, real quick, so for those of you that want documentary video uh, evidence uh, or information, there is a 32-minute video put on by David Garcia called Requiem 29, and it deals with the inquest into the death of Ruben Salazar. An inquest is just a formal inquiry to decide whether he died by accident or whether he died at the hands of another. If they make a finding of died at the hands of the other, that normally, typically would lead to the filing of uh, charges, sort of like a public grand jury as opposed to a private. And the finding of the inquest was that uh, Ruben did die at the hands of another but no one was ever charged with that. So that's one video that you folks uh, should uh, uh, look for and watch. The other is the Mexican-American civil rights story. And there is a one hour segment called Taking Back Our Schools. I think uh, Jesus Trevino was involved in uh, the overall making of those four one hour videos. And uh, it, it deals uh, largely with what happened during the blowouts and in the trial and then the sit-ins at the uh, school board. Uh, you folks who are watching tonight's program have the benefit though of speaking to two people who were there during that time period and who actually recognize these people on a first name basis. Anyone else you recognize in these photos, either Oscar or Luis? Um, right behind, uh, I can't see his face. I have other other shots, which I unfortunately I didn't send you. Um, is Father Luce behind the 
young man next to the... Uh, oh, I see his collar. Yeah, you see the collar? That's Father Luce. So Father Luce was with the Church of the Epiphany. How did you folks come to have a relationship with him enough to where he allowed you folks to use the church as sort of the headquarters for La Raza? Uh, that's a, a birthing process that starts with... Uh, they had... Uh, um, Father Luce had, a, with the Episcopalian Church, they had a social action program, uh, which was national in scope. And Eliseo Risco, who was a field rep for the farm workers, uh, had come into Los Angeles uh, to do organizing on behalf of Cesar Chavez, who had met Father Luce. And so Father Luce then uh, introduces Eliseo Risco, who is of Cuban background and Cuban uh, uh, immigrant who comes to uh, the West Coast and is working in various different areas, uh, but specifically with uh, Cesar Chavez in terms of organizing. So Eliseo comes into Los Angeles. He meets up with Father Luz, who gives him space. And then Father Luz, uh, um, uh, brings up the idea of creating a newspaper magazine for organizing. And uh, that then he brings in Ruth Robinson, who also works with the farm workers. And they begin with uh, Benny Luna, who does the artwork for the first issues of uh, the La Raza. And then a host of other people that begin to come in to play Moctezuma Esparza, uh, uh, Joe Rasso, etc. A whole bunch of people start coming in, and that's the foundation, the beginnings of uh, La Raza newspaper. So uh, you were not you were not just limited to um, taking Im images of Chicanos. You and Oscar uh, both have a body of work where you just go everywhere. This is in your home state. This right? is uh, this is in my barrio, the, the South Bronx, and this is in the area of 139th Street between St. Anne's and Brook Avenue. I had met young lords who had come out to L.A., and on a number of trips that I had made back east, they invited me to hang out with them. So uh, that's what I did. I uh, mm -hmm. out with them, and there's uh, uh, several rolls of film that I took of uh, the young lords. And so was this a, a gathering, a meeting, a protest, or? This was just a gathering of young lords, you know, just getting together or, you know, just cheering on the people and such like that. And this is also a young representative of uh, the young lords who was uh, uh, selling the newspaper called Palante. And uh, Huey Newton had just been released from jail and uh, they put welcome back. Uh, so I capture this image of this woman young woman uh, who is selling the newspapers and the backdrop just fits so appropriately uh, to what and who she is. Uh, right. And uh, it just, with all the other posters and images there, and she just stands out with the American flag with welcome back Huey and Palante. So you get this whole sense of Boricua and, uh, and Black Panthers and uh, and U.S. and uh, all of these other things that are going on because it's a hippie shop. It, you know, it's a smoke shop, <laughs> which is where they're selling all of these posters. And it's a store with sensitivity. Uh, homeboys. <laughs> it, now this is my favorite shot. I, um, when I was at North High School, I landed in Riverside in 78 in 10th grade. And I was lucky enough to take a Mexican-American studies class with a professor by the name of teacher, by the name of Richard Monguia. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the school books that they handed out in order for us to read, which is required reading, was the poem by Corky Gonzalez, Yo Soy Joaquin. And this photo, this photo graces the cover of that. And I've always loved this photograph. I, you know, the guy with the hat reminds me of my brother because that's how my brother wore his hat with attitude. It's like, mm -hmm. don't mess with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, uh, this is taken in uh, the Aliso Pico projects. Um, and again, it's just one of a whole series of shots because, you know, basically I'm a street walker. Uh, I'm a street photographer. Um, I, I, whatever I'm surrounded with. And 
I do a lot of portraiture work. Now that I look back at my work, it's a lot of portraiture work. Um, and the ability to capture an image such as Cesar Chavez. This is 1974 at the Biltmore Hotel. And it's a uh, conference uh, that's going on between uh, UAW and the United Farm Workers. And Cesar invited me up to the hotel room uh, and I'm just sitting across the bed from him, you know, just a couple of feet away from him. And so this is one of, again, of several rolls of film and images that I took of him. The irony of this is that um, I was uh, contacted by a friend at Time Life magazine who called me out of the blue to tell me, Luis, our photographer journalist cannot make the flight to LA and we got to get this story on Cesar. Are you willing to cover the uh, the event uh, with Cesar Chavez, we'll get clearance for you. Uh, we can't supply you with film or anything else like that because it's it's too late. Uh, so can you? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? So <clears throat> I went, I met, I introduced myself to Cesar and his people. They, they brought me in and I hung out with them for that most of the day capturing these images. I sent the film off to New York to Time Life and uh, then within a short time afterwards, they said, uh, they returned everything to me and they said, we're not running the story. Mm. <laughs> so I said, okay, fine. And so it remained in my archive all of this time. Um, this is um, um, uh, Rodriguez, I forgot her first name. Um, this is at uh, the uh, January 31st, that's Rosalia Munoz. And in the background on the walkie-talkie is Esteban Torres. Uh, Celia Luna Rodriguez, that's her name, Celia Luna Rodriguez. Uh, she was a major organizer against police brutality. And uh, so that's where that photograph was taken. Again, and again, there's just, you know, half a dozen more. Huh? So you traveled, uh, you traveled the world. So you, you, you weren't just a Chicano photographer uh, in California or a photographer in your hometown. You actually went other places in the world. This is Budapest, Hungary. And this is El Maestro David Alfaro Siqueiros. <clears throat> um, and the image got printed. And actually, the exhibition Siqueiros in LA, uh, Censorship Defied, came about because of these photographic images when people asked me, what the hell were you doing in Budapest, Hungary in 1971? <laughs> and so as I told them the story, they said, you got to write this down. You got to do something with it. Well, out of these images came the uh, exhibition, my first exhibition, wow. curated exhibition at the Autry Museum. But the I way I got there, the way I got there is interesting because it comes about uh, through uh, a man who is now deceased, uh, uh, the Peace, uh, uh, Peace Action uh, Committee, uh, who comes into La Raza saying we'd like a representative uh, to attend the dele U.S. delegation to Budapest, Hungary and the World Peace Conference. And everybody else was caught up with uh, police trials and everything else like that. So I volunteered and I wind up in Budapest, Hungary. And Siqueiros, when he hears that there's a Chicano in the American delegation, he calls for a meeting and he says, compañero, <laughs> cuéntame de este movimiento Chicano. And he sits me down between himself and his wife, Angelica, here, Angelica Arinal, who we're saying goodbye. She's getting into this little Volkswagen and she turns to me and she says, Luis, como dicen ustedes, Chicana power. <laughs> I can't believe you met Siqueiros. Wow. Um, I can't believe it either because it's, uh, again, it's fate, it's karma. And I truly believe that many of the things that I've become involved with, there's a purpose, there's a predestiny that I never knew that I had. Los dioses mandan. Exactly. So, uh, Oscar. So you saw yourself as just a photographer. You were paying for everything out of pocket. Right. What, what were your target images? When, at what point? What, what do you mean? 
So now, now the moratorium is, is over, you know, there's a variety of different things uh, going on. Do you continue uh, in that vein of photography of uh, protests in 71 and 72? Or do you now branch off to other things? Or is that the time period that you go to Texas? No, no, uh, I had already been to, to, to Crystal City. And by the mid 70s, well, I was um, looking to document a broader, broader part of the, of the Hispanic or the Chicano community. And so I started doing, you know, cultural events and uh, just people in general. Uh, I, I didn't mind, you know, many uh, topics and themes, but, you know, I, as a photographer, I also did, ur you know, urban, st urban scapes, you know, study of the environment, the city. And uh, as a matter of fact, this, the Smithsonian has uh, some of my photographs that where I documented, uh, you know, ur ur urban renewal, um, um, some of my photographs from the, the, a series that I was doing in the 70s, uh, they were used in a book, uh, which the Smithsonian uh, also uh, uh, sponsored. It, it was based on a book called These Mean Streets. And they did a, an exhibit at the Smithsonian and was later went to the Museo del Barrio in New York. So, you know, my images have, have kind, of, kind of taken on a life of their own. Uh, um, I mean, we talk about my archives in, on one hand, but my active things on the other hand. Uh, so I, I got involved with the, uh, with the business community. I was doing stuff for, you know, to make money at Chamber of Commerce and that. But I, I think if you're, a lot of my images have been used, for instance, um, a very well-known uh, lecturer, um, uh, Gregorio Luke. He he and I collaborated on an exhibit which which was um, we titled uh, El Movimiento and Beyond, and that kind of a philosophy where yes, I mean the Movimiento is important, but myself I need to do a little bit more, you know, a little bit more upscale stuff, a little bit more positive stuff. So I tried to document cheerful things, you know, things that people would, uh, would say, oh, yeah, that's, that's something that reminds me, they could remind them of something they've done or something they enjoy. So I, I like to do positive things. And I, I sent you some images of, you know, cultural things. And um, uh, I worked a lot with artists, like with the um, Goez Art Gallery, with Mexicano Art Center and have exhibited with many artists. I've become friends with many artists like Los Four, uh, very well-known uh, you know, artists. I became friends with a very dear lady, uh, Josefina Quesada, who was also uh, studied with Siqueiros. And she came up here to, to work on restoring his mural, America Tropical. So we became dear friends. And I, you know, I have a series of artists that I've documented over the years. And I'm, I'm um, she being one of them, but different artists uh, that are, you know, like uh, Asco and Almaraz and Frank Romero and uh, and and um, and dancers, um, musicians. So I, I like to do up 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 things as long as, you know. Besides the negative, a few negative things, but I like to do up upscale things. Well, I think that the documenting everything life, everyday life, I think is important. Uh, yeah, you know. I, I think you, had, you you shared a word with me, which I forgot. You said something about anthropological something. You called it, you gave it a name, which was kind of interesting. I call it ethnog you, you, a, a pictorial eth ethnography is how I call it. Okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Let me interject just a moment here. I want to thank Oscar for bringing up Josefina Quesada's name. Uh, she's very important to the conservation and the <laughs> return to public view of Siqueiros' mural, America Tropical. Uh, she, um, the story behind her, and again, these are, these are the stories that are so important, because photographically, what Oscar and I are doing, and a number of others, consciously, uh, even more so now, is documenting a background history of 
people who have never been given their recognition or their due within the larger uh, circle of uh, the cultural explorations and developments that we've been going through over these years and decades and centuries. And Josefina was anointed, appointed by David Alza Parosiqueros to go and look at the mural of America Tropical and to give him a report, a condition report, because the first efforts to conserve the mural was being done through uh, Schiffer Goldman and Plaza de la Raza and a host of uh, people from our community to conserve the mural. And so the first efforts to conserve the mural come out of our community. It doesn't come out of the Getty. It comes out of our community. And it's a long, long struggle. So Josefina goes back and forth and reports to Siqueiros on the condition. And then eventually she comes to live here in Los Angeles and Oscar meets her, I meet her, and she becomes part of the mural movement here in Los Angeles. And she becomes a vibrant part of uh, the, the, the muralist movement within our community. She works with people from Spark, she works with uh, Judy Baca, with any number of, uh, of artistas uh, in doing mural work. And her murals still stand in different parts of uh, Los Angeles. Um, so it's important to note because the conservation and the eventual presentation of America Tropical at Olvera Street starts with Josefina Quesada coming into Los Angeles. Y es una mujer de, del pueblo, right. heart and soul. And you got to give that recognition to those people that have never received it. Punto. Right. So you know it's uh, if you if if you believe it it's seven fifty one, mm. and I remember when we you know got together for our first phone chat, there was the fear that we wouldn't have enough to talk about, and here <laughs> we are ten minutes till eight, uh, and and we still haven't talked about or shared uh, Oscar's images from Texas or the images of you know 18th street i looked at his catalog on um, at the ucla he's got acción he's got daniel valdez he's got uh, bobby espinosa he's got i mean he's you know oscar's work is is on display uh, we haven't talked about what mm -hmm. uh, publications you folks have for sale we're going to get to that before we end somebody asked for the songs that i played i played yo soy chicano by los alvarado Cubo Raza by uh, Agustin Lira and Patricia Wells Solorzano. Brown-Eyed Children of the Sun, that was uh, Daniel Valdez off of the Mestizo album. I want to invite Ofelia Valdez to uh, come and give us a chat uh, because this is done in conjunction with Cause Connect and with the uh, Riverside Art Museum and the Cheech. So I'd like to invite Ofelia to give us a little chat. Ofelia, welcome. Nice to see you again. Buenas noches, thank you so much, and to your speakers, it's an honor. Um, I'm old enough to have uh, been around during that time, so it's uh, very touching, all, the, all that I've heard this evening. Uh, my uh, part tonight is to remind everyone about the Cheech, uh, something that I am hopeful, Luis and Oscar, that we can convince you to bring, uh, maybe develop an exhibit um, as soon as we can and bring it to the Cheech. That's what it's all about. And just to give an update, uh, some of you already have this information, but for those of you who don't, everything is moving forward. We have found a, uh, um, a contractor that's going through the city. The final agreements have to be approved by the city council and we're very hopeful that that will be done this fall. Also, for those of you who know anyone, I'm sure you do, we will soon be recruiting for the Cheech Subject Matter Expert Curator. We're very excited about that. Finally, the uh, Cheech will have its own curator. And we're pleased to announce that Union Pacific has awarded us $15,000 to go for programming at the Cheech. 
And if anybody would like to continue to donate at any level, we invite you to text 44321 and enter Cheech. Very excited about that. Um, and finally, I just wanted to show you the latest that we have in this time of the coronavirus. We have our own beach mask that you can order through uh, the museum, www.riversideartmuseum.org slash the teach store. And if you follow our assemblyman, uh, Jose Medina, who is responsible for $10.7 million that came to the teach, he is wearing it and uh, with the bill that is sure to pass for ethnic studies, his colleagues are also wearing them. So the teach is getting around everywhere. I invite all of you, if you have any questions, please uh, give us a call, contact the museum. And thank you again to our speakers. It's been a thrill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So some, somebody wanted to thank you for mentioning uh, Chicanas. There was one that wanted to know what's going to be the name of the uh, Cheech uh, a museum. It's going to be the Cheech Marine Center for Chicano Art, Culture, and Industry. And uh, people are asking if there's going to be a part two to this discussion. Uh, I am open to that, uh, uh, depending on schedules. Uh, Oscar, uh, do you have a publication that is available for purchase. And what is the name of that publication? Well, the publication is the Oscar Castillo Papers and Photograph Collection. And it's available through UCLA or on Amazon. And it's a it's a um, it's a um, oral history, which was done by Elise Masadiego, edited by a Colin. Um, uh, I can't think of his name right now. Oh, Colin Grunkle. I'm sorry. And and through uh, through <laughs> through through a, a Chon Noriega and the Chicano Studies Library. But here's a picture of it, and um, it's. I really enjoyed working with uh, the Chicano Studies Library, and and uh, we got uh, five or six um, scholars and my friends who wrote. Uh, that's one of the things I like about my photographs is I, I I enjoy when they inspire people to write, and and some people have chosen some of my photographs and written about them, oh. or some people have just written about their you know their there are our friendship or how, what they knew about me. So it's, it's a, I mean, I recommend it. And I hope you can, uh, at some point, I'd like to have it at the Cheech for sale there at the Cheech too. If yeah, it's gonna, available, I'm sorry. We'll definitely work that one out. Uh, Luis, do you have any publications for sale, sir? Um, I don't have publications for sale. The uh, La Raza catalog is already online for sale. Uh, I would suggest to people to go to my Facebook site, Luis e. Garza, and you scroll through, you'll come down to any number of photographic images, which uh, you've been seeing on uh, this uh, podcast here. And if you contact Natalie Gonzalez, uh, she's my agent, she's my representative, she's my co-author artist worker. She, you contact her at uh, Natalie at, uh, mobyarts.com natalie at mobyarts.com and uh, there you uh, will see uh, some of my work we're still in the process of silk screening and printing my work that's my next endeavor taking those photographic images that you have seen and transferring them into a silk screen process addition of 50 in black and white and an addition of 30 in <laughs> hand painted uh, colorization by myself. Everything is signed, everything is uh, identified and uh, the seal of approval is on them and it is on the highest quality silk screen. The master silk screen printer is Jose Alpuche, which those of you who know in the silk screen world is the master. He comes out of uh, silk screen work in Mexico and through uh, <clears throat> self-help graphics. Nice. I look forward to all of that. I want everyone who's listening to put their video on because I'd like for uh, Oscar and Luis to be able to see 
all the folks uh, who are on tonight. So I see Ofelia, I see Cristina Guadalupe Preciado, I see Moises Castillo, Patricia Reynolds, Melissa Richardson Banks, Catherine Trujillo, Erica Alfaro, Yvette Reynoso, Ninfa Delgado, Alicia Caballero, Mayo Yarrington, Paula Matusa, Lydia Delgado, Rosa Maria uh, Vasquez, Gabriela Gomez, Diana Martinez, Valerie Found, uh, Cristina Trujillo. Now let me go to my next screen. Because uh, oh I have gosh. another screen. This is uh, wonderful. Okay. I have uh, Karen, I have Holly, uh, I have Christina Preciado. Uh, it, everybody else on my second screen refuses to uh, show me their mascara, I mean their face. <laughs> okay, Brad Darrell is on, Martha Ar Arguello is on. Uh, let's see. On the video right now. Amelia uh, Melba Winsel, Michael Mend, uh, Julia Fernandez. Uh, so I, I, I really appreciate you uh, folks participating tonight. I know it's, uh, we'd rather do this live to where, you know, we could see each other and we can talk and we can chat and we can converse, but this is the best that we can do under the circumstances and knowledge should not stop just because COVID has put a stop to us getting together yeah. and we will make do with what we have. Chicanos have yeah. always tried to figure out the latest technology in order to get things working. This, this is just another example. This will never be flawless. So if anybody wants a flawless presentation, then you need to go somewhere else because it ain't <laughs> happening here. But we do get by. And as somebody yeah. put, uh, puts it, we need to be very forgiving uh, with the technical issues. I appreciate that because, you know, at uh, 57 years old, I didn't grow up with Zoom. At 77, Luis and Oscar did not grow up with Zoom. Uh, <laughs> so, but we do in fact make it occur. We make it happen. And this is just the second of a series Enjoy. of Zoom chats we're going to have. We have one coming up September 16th, where we're going to be talking about soldies the Chicanos who do oldies uh, and the, the just the flourishment of groups that are coming up, youngsters who are playing the music that I was listening to when I was growing up. So we're going to be doing that. And then obviously we'll have some other chats. Stay glued to the Riverside Art Museum Facebook page because everything is posted. Those of you that received your invite, there are resources there that you could click on that if you want to, uh, uh, you know, get more information, more material, you can definitely do so. Oscar and Luis, anything you want to say as we, as we fade into the background? Well, I, I'd like to say thank you to everybody for tuning in and especially to those that I recognize, Vera uh, Martinez, Irene Blea, Rosa Maria Marquez, uh, I see Jose Luis Sedano out there and a couple other people. So th thank you all and um, see you next time if, I, if there is a next time. Thank you. Thank you. I would like, I would like to extend un abrazo, un cariño, un agradecimiento a todos. This is my new family. Welcome. I appreciate all of you. De veramentes. Chicanismo is love and Chicanismo is family. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, one more thing I ever got to especially thank you, Jorge, and, and to uh, Drew, and to uh, Melissa, and to all the staff at the Cheech for inviting us and having us here. Always a heartfelt thank to the Riverside thank Art Museum. I, Kelly, Valerie Found, Karen Marcella, Drew Oberjergi. Uh, they make uh, doing these programs so easy and they give you know all the support possible. I met Melissa Richardson Banks, and she is just uh, a toda madre. She is on it, and she, you know, put this uh, together and and helped all of us do that. So, uh, thank you to each and every one of you, and look forward to more uh, programming. Gracias. And, uh, and as as the song says, I second that emotion. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm going to play a song to lead us out. Orale. Okay. <laughs> Adios, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> Did you see? Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be interesting.
Nos vamos a la lucha, escucha, escucha que la tierra es chicana y me levanto en la mañana y sé que soy hijo del sol. Es fruto de la tierra, mi tierra, tierra contra el capitalista que continúa la conquista de la gran gente del sol. Jefita in the field. She's struggling for a better deal. Oye, vato loco, que no sabes que soy vato loco. Y me importa poco, me importa poco. Y ando, ando en mi Chevy cruising, never losing any time at all. Sabes que soy vato loco y me importa poco, me importa poco Y ando, ando en mi Chevy Cruising, never losing any time at all
So I played that, Oscar, because uh, you had some photos of Conjunto Aslan. All oh, right. Oh, I didn't know that's what it was. Yeah, that's Conjunto Aslan out of uh, Texas. Oh. And uh, they performed at our Radio Aslan Music Festival. And I have both their CDs, and I even have their original uh, 45. So I played that for you. Okay, well, thank you. That was a great <laughs> song. But actually, I, it's another Conjunto Aslan I know. So there is uh, more than one. There's one ah. in, out of uh, Cal State Northridge. Okay, this one's from yeah. San Antonio, from the Guadalupe great, Arts great. Center in San Antonio. Oh, that's great. Are you, you folks ready to quit? Uh, actually, I'm working on my first bottle of wine, and um, I'm just getting uh, geared up, man, for the next conversation. All right, cool. So I want to thank you again, this, so thank you. Good night. Muchas gracias, Jorge. Un abrazo. Good night, Luis, and everybody else, and Jorge. I, I, we're, we're pulling the plug then, right? Simon. That's okay. it. That's it. Right. He's got to get his glass of wine. All right. <laughs>